Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and in addition to podcasting, I'm a leadership coach, a mastermind facilitator, a speaker, and an author. And yes, please check out my book. It's also titled Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership. Thanks for listening. And as a podcast enthusiast, I hope you'll help us make this show even better. Go to patmcdowell.com and you cannot miss the pop-up that will arrive as you visit the homepage. Give us five minutes of your best ideas. We'll review every one and welcome the creativity you have for topics and future guests going forward. Now, I know you're going to enjoy this fantastic conversation I had with Crystal Cherry and Renee Rubin Ross who are both doing critical work across the United States, supporting nonprofit leaders just like you, especially as you interact with your board of directors. Now, as a nonprofit leader listening, I know you can relate to some of the difficult situations Crystal and Renee have encountered. How do you assure your board is more representative of the communities you serve? And how do you make actual progress toward diversity? Now, many boards say the right thing, but genuine change is not easy and is often resisted. Now, what's great about Renee and Crystal's approach is that they've been in these boardrooms and can give you practical advice to truly advance this important agenda. Lots of reasons to check out the show notes for this episode. It's number 174. Just go to the podcast page at PattonMcDowell.com, and you can find out more f- about all of the resources we discuss, as well as more information on Crystal and Renee and the great work they're doing through their respective consulting practices. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Crystal Cherry and Renee Rubin Ross. Crystal and Renee, thank you for joining me on the path. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm excited about this conversation. It's an important topic that is sometimes difficult for nonprofit leaders to grasp and grapple with, um, both for the staff leadership as well as the board leaders in which you both work. So I'm excited about the insight you're going to bring to our listeners who need to address this very important topic. So before we unpack the issues of DEI training for board members and boards of directors. Crystal, let's start with you. Talk about your journey. What brought you to the work you're doing now? Yeah, so Pat, thank you again for having me. Um, Prior to working with boards, I was in the nonprofit space working as a fundraiser. Um, I had worked my way up to chief development officer. I had been a vice president of of development uh, for a few organizations and then worked my way up to chief development officer. Uh, And quite frankly, after 23 years, I just burned out. Um, (laughs) I just, I wanted to do something else. I decided to become a consultant. I worked at a consulting firm for a while as a fundraising consultant. I thought I wanted to see, you know, from the other side, what other organizations were going through. And it was interesting work to actually go into those boardrooms and meet with the the chief development officer and the executive director and the board to learn about some of their challenges. Um, But I decided even after doing that for a while that I wanted to step out on my own and do my own thing. And I wasn't sure what that was going to look like, uh, but just kept thinking about all the board meetings I had sat in where the board members just looked so apathetic and so disengaged and so bored um, and confused. (laughs) Uh, And I just said, you know what? I think there's some work in this space. I think I can take everything that I've learned as a fundraiser in terms of, you know, being engaging, telling the story, building relationships, cultivation, stewardship, all the things that I learned to do as a fundraiser are all the same things you have to do when working with board members because they are volunteers, right? And we should cultivate relationships with them just like we do with our donors. So I decided that was a space that I was going to land in. And then, you know, gratefully, I met Renee along the way. Uh, We ended up in some same Zoom rooms and uh, decided that we had some mutual interests and we decided that we wanted to work together. And so far, it's been a blast. So. Love that story. Love that story, Crystal. Your inspiration is clear. (laughs) And and clearly, we're going to learn more from you about it, as we will, Renee, from you. So talk about your journey uh, that ultimately connected you with Crystal. 
Yeah, so I always say that as a kid, I was the kind of geeky kid in the back of the library who didn't really fit in and didn't always feel included. And then um, I have a long time background in the nonprofit sector and really started thinking, you know, as I was leading different conversations and meetings, who is included, who does not feel included, who has power, um, and really paying attention to all of that. And it, it got a lot deeper as um, the director of the Cal State East Bay Nonprofit Management Certificate Program, I'm working with my students who are a rainbow of different people of different racial backgrounds, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian American, and them asking me about boards and saying, you know, teaching board development, having my students say to me, well, what's happening with these boards? Why are they mostly at this point, the many of the most of the boards we've met, particularly of historically white uh, led organizations are mostly white and why is this happening and why is well, you know where is where is the power and how do we do this differently um so that more uh, more of us you know more people from diverse racial backgrounds really uh can speak up and have power and and so there was a lot of challenges that i got from my students and I, and I had to think about, you know, okay, I, what do I need to teach and share? Um, and what, what is the learning journey that I, as a white person, need to go on to, to, you know, to be someone who can lead this conversation along with others. And then, as Crystal says, we got to meet on, on Zoom and then we, and then she had a project. We got to work together um, with a board and we'll be telling you about that, you know, with a couple of boards, but at this point, and it's just been a great cross-race collaboration. So we keep learning from each other. It's really fun. I, I love that. And again, that maybe that's the silver lining of the pandemic. You never know who you might meet in the Zoom room. And exactly. so yeah. and you're saying again, Crystal, you two literally first met in a Zoom room and yeah. just resonated. I guess what both of you were saying must have resonated I with the other. Absolutely. And I, um, I I had a client who wanted me to come in and talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I had this idea to ask Renee, who had who I had heard and I had seen in different rooms, and I thought she would be so awesome. She's smart. She's passionate. Um, and I just reached out and said, hey, you want to try to do something together? And she said, yes. And, and, and it worked. One so, thing led to another. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Renee, why don't I let you take, what exactly kind of work do you two do together for our listeners who are now right. meeting right. you, so to speak? Talk about the work you do. So we are working with organizations that are medium to large size nonprofits, and we're running a training. It's like a, a six month training, and it has different parts to it. So we, you know, and we each lead different parts. Um, it starts off uh, with, with uh, assessment. You know, what is actually, actually, I mean, I would say that it starts off with assessment, but actually, really, what it tends to start off with is some kind of challenge yeah. that the organ, and they don't yeah. even always tell us <laughs> yeah. about the so challenge the ahead of time. You yeah. know? So, so, I mean, it's funny, this one, we got pulled in to work on and it turned, what they didn't tell us was that, which is, you know, that several women of color had left the board because, and they didn't tell us why, you know, <laughs> this is kind of going in. So, so anyway, assessment, you know, trying to understand what's happened, right? And then from there, we, we each have some parts that we lead. Crystal um, leads a conversation to start thinking about bias and where does bias show up and how do we, we all live with bias. We do a really powerful um, workshop on race stories. And what are the race stories that we each um, have grown up with and that are part of our autobiographies and we, and crystal and i model that um and then we do some race caucus meetings where we have a, a white caucus and a black indigenous people of color caucus i'm leading the white caucus so there's a building of safe spaces right and then at the end we come together and we the organization creates a plan for the future Oh, love um, that. And yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and we're going to unpack it. I know because the process is is deeper uh, mm -hmm. at each step, mm -hmm. I'm sure, than we can summarize. But Crystal, I guess an organization needs to have some degree of awareness and willingness to tackle this, what potentially can be a tricky topic. Is that fair? And then, of course, maybe they haven't fully embraced yes. the issues until you get there. Is that fair? 
Exactly. Yeah. I, I think sometimes they don't even realize what they're, what's in store for them. Right. So they'll say that they're interested in doing this work. And then when they delve into it with us, you know, you, we get some resistance, you know, yeah. we get some yeah. silence. Um, some people are, are, are all go ho, gung ho and let's go for it. And the other people become real, you know, reticent to, uh, to really jump in when you start asking them to share their race stories and talk about racism and talk about white supremacy, people get uncomfortable. You're still seeing some shifting in your seat. Uh, yes. and yes. but we tell them, we tell them that this is going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be comfortable because we all have to, um, we have to own what's going on here. We have to own the history of this country. We have to own what's happened. And that is not, that's not a good feeling. Not always easy. Not, yeah, uh, yeah, right. yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we tell people that this is voluntary work. You're going to lose some people along the way, right? You're going to have some casualties. Yep. Um, and, and that's okay. You're going to have some board members who say, you know what? I don't want to have these conversations. I'm, I'm not in for it. You're going to have some donors. You're going to have some volunteers. You're going to have some staff people. We say, I don't want to work for the organization that's doing this now. I'm not interested. So, um, and those who stay along usually find that it's worth it. So, um, thanks. Well, and you touched on something I was going to ask you, because I can imagine, particularly a, a board member of privilege is going to say, Renee, uh, we, we don't need this. Well, I, I didn't join the board to get into this kind of stuff, right? I'm here because of our mission. How do you respond to the resistance that maybe Crystal just alluded to. Yeah, so I think, so a couple things. So one of them is um, is the assessment process that we do. We really, uh, we really bring out the different perspectives. So, so for example, um, we were talking, we did a, a while back, Crystal and I did a conversation with a prospective client and we said to him, um, this is a white man, we said to him, well, do you think everybody feels a sense of belonging on your board? Because you know, we talk a lot about belonging, and he said, "Oh yeah, I think so." You know, I, yeah. He's why sure they? they are. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then we said to him, "Well, well, how do you know?" And he's like, "Well, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. I just asked a few of my friends." <laughs> and and so it's like, so when we go in there, we don't just ask one or two people. We are doing. We're surveying the whole board. And we're interviewing, you know, we're interviewing people from different racial backgrounds. And then we are holding up a mirror. That is the assessment process. You know, this is what your board members are saying. This is what your staff members are saying. This is what we're hearing. And there are enough, I mean, when we are brought in, when people bring us in, there are enough people who do see the need for change. I mean, that's why they, they bring us. Yes. You know, that's why they, right. they hire us. At least us. they if, did that. Yeah, if they didn't, feel that there is a need for change, they, they would not have reached out. So then it's a matter of, of showing that there's a critical mass of people who want that and that there's some really key perspectives that, you know, of, of some challenges and what and and then um, sharing those with the group and encouraging the group to problem solve together. Yeah, and, and Crystal, I'm sure you face this your whole life. I mean, you're dealing with boards that are probably white led male led they, they're they not diverse I, is that how do you help an organization i guess at least they if they acknowledge they need more diversity but you don't want to get into tokenism so how do you encourage a, a board like that to become more representative of its community well i first i ask some questions i i ask you know what who are you serving yeah <laughs> yeah do you feel like your your board represents that community and a lot of times they will say no and then I'll, there are some questions that you need to answer. You need to ask yourself about who's on the board. You need to ask yourself about the culture, about the policies that you all are practicing, the behaviors. Are you ready? You know, are you ready? If you're saying you want to diversify your board, you want to bring in different people with different mindsets and different lived experiences, are you ready to receive those viewpoints? You know, are you are you going to be open if someone says, well, I disagree. I don't have that same experience. Uh, or I can't pay the five thousand dollar give or get dues. Yeah. Or, you know, yep. or you know, I don't have a car, and therefore I can't make the meeting that's all the way out in the suburbs. <laughs> or I can't come at seven o'clock in the morning because I'm a single mom and I have five children or four children, and I can't make it at seven o'clock in the morning. So I mean, those are the kinds of questions that we ask them. Are you really ready and prepared to to open this up so that you are going to be receiving people? who don't have the same experiences and the same thought processes as you are. 
And, you know, and, you know, that gives people pause sometimes. Like, absolutely. Well, I, I, uh, uh, I'm not, we, we never really thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Cause we've done it the way we've always done it. Right. Exactly. Which exactly. is convenient for me and my friends. Yes. But perhaps not the representative community, but yes, there are, Renee, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things we we do talk a lot about language, you know, so I see like diversity is a fact, right? You have you may have we have a diverse nation, but there's also this idea of equity, right, which is the people who are closest to the problems are working towards the solutions and systems are shifted so that people who have been outside of power can move closer to power. Yes. And and really talk, like uh, encouraging board members to think about, well, you know, diversity isn't just coming in with this idea of diversity is not going to get you very far, because if you're not able to work on your culture, it, you're going to have you're just going to have people come on your board, feel that they don't belong and they're going to they're not going to stay because wh why would you if you know, if if somebody feels that their perspective isn't honored. That's right. so well put in. Well, Crystal, you, I guess, address some of the cultural, in other words, okay, I agree. We need to change our culture. Is it addressing some of the things you just posed, like maybe our meeting times, our meeting availability, accessibility, or how do we, how do we change culture? Yeah, you know, and it's even bigger than that. I mean, yeah, we want you to change your meeting times. We want your meetings to be in a convenient location, but it really is about power. Renee said a key key word there that I think we often don't talk enough about, um, and this idea that if I have to share power, that that means this, that that I get less, you know. And so I'm so used to hoarding the power. I'm so used to being at the top um, <laughs> that I That's don't right. want to share. I don't want to give you my piece of the pie. I've had the whole pie all this time. You've had the crumbs, right? <laughs> you just had a small piece of the pie. If I open it up and give you more of my pie, that means I have less pie, right? right? And so therefore, I don't want to do that. I want to remain in power. I want to be the person who helps uh, shape the way we think. I want to be the person who makes the decisions, you know? And so now I'm giving you an opportunity to weigh in. What does that mean for me? Uh, and so that's a whole different mindset shift. So it's not only about where the meetings are held, but are you willing to now step aside and let someone else speak, let yes. someone else's thoughts become become mm -hmm. um, more relevant. Um, I, so I, that's what I think. That's well put. And I I wonder, Renee, first to you, but both of you that are I'm sensing more funders are attuned to this representative board leadership. And does that give you both perhaps some leverage in making boards pay attention? Uh, I guess Renee first, then Crystal. Yes, I think it is one motivation for organizations because they do need to fill out grant requests that say, you know, what percentage of, you know, that, that ask about board demographics. Yep. Um, but so, I mean, some of what we are working on over time is really, you know, building empathy, building understanding, because, because without that, that, you know, I think that's where, that is where the energy comes from to make change. That's why we do the race stories to really understand like, you know, as people share their stories, it they are shocked. <laughs> shocked they probably never shared them before in that setting, right? Shocked and, you know, like, and for, you know, for some people it's like, this isn't something that we talk about, you know, for some white people, for some right. people, it, for people of color, it's often, we had to talk about race in my home and, and because it is so important for you know for our family's survival basically and so just kind of understanding the different perspectives that people are bringing and you know in the same way that and it's like you need that capacity to talk about race if you're going to serve as an organ you know if you're going to be serving people of different racial backgrounds and start to have conversations about what's happening with you know with your clients whoever they might be yeah, right. uh, I just I wanted to, you know, just be to be really concrete, like we worked with this museum and one of, one of the questions was, well, what would happen if you had a pop up exhibit in this, you know, in this black neighborhood? And it was so interesting to see the conversation. And then, you know, so there were some black board members who said this would be fabulous, you know, and, and you know, all this would be, we could really expand who the museum is serving. And this is a this cultural institution has felt pre 
pretty exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's funding and it's also, you know, future clients. Crystal, I, I don't know what, yeah. I, there's more to say about this. I Go know. ahead. Well, <laughs> Crystal, you can run with that too, I'm sure. <laughs> No, well, what I was going to say on the foundation level, we have found that more foundations who have diversified their boards have changed some of their policies and practices, particularly as it relates to funding and who they fund and yes. their criteria for funding. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are focusing their energies and efforts on organizations that, that serve black and brown people, particularly women, particularly immigrants. Um, and they're changing some of the criteria for the funding that they are actually disseminating out to these organizations. They're recognizing that, you know, some of our organizations led by people of color don't have big boards. They don't have exactly. big rich boards who can give them the money and, and give access to resources and power. The 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 um the CEO or executive director of those nonprofits sometimes don't have the contacts in those in those big communities. They're not at the golf course, they're not in the rooms where the big players are. Right. And so therefore they don't have the same resources. So therefore, when you when they're filling out that application for funding, some of the things that we're asking them to do, they can't answer or they don't qualify for because because of the position that they're in. So I think just in diversifying the board and who's at the top of that of those foundations is really making a difference. And my mantra, who's at the top matters really, really shows his head in these in these particular instances. So yes, I think um, that is actually the, the case. And in terms of access and belonging, you know, that is, is, instance where Renee was talking about the museum, and in that case, the museum was, had been moved uh, to an area of town where the Black folks felt like they didn't have access to it. They had to travel to get there. It wasn't easily. And the message they got was, well, this, this museum is not for us. Yes, right? it's, 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 exactly. it doesn't. And so, um, and so Renee did a great thing. She chose one of the Black pieces of art um, uh, in the museum and used that as, uh, as a piece that we talked about in one of our, our exercises that we did. And I actually went and visited the museum. And do you know that piece of art was one of very few pieces uh, with black characters in it. It was in the on the last wall in the behind in the, in the exhibit. It was a big exhibit house. You had to go walk through all the exhibit to find that piece. And I just thought, I mean, yeah, what artwork, does that tell us? The artwork yeah. was beautiful. I'm not right. you know, dismissing that, but I'm just saying that here we are in in the South. <laughs> You know, a Jim Crow South, and you, in order for you to find some black artwork in this museum, you had to walk all the way to the back. And if you didn't make it to all the way to the back, then you missed it. You'd never see it. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And I, I guess what I mean, what you brought out, Crystal, is you know, this is this work is boundary crossing. I mean, it's not, and that's why it is actually it is active work. It takes energy. It takes. Hmm, I'm going to go out of this is behavior change. I'm going to go out of my well groomed patterns. You know, and and then I think the the question around that is what's the motivation? What what keeps people wanting to do that? And so I think I think that for boards is really talking about you know what why do you feel this is important? And you know for so many of the board members we've talked to, it's actually like I'm a white board member and I have my friend who's black and I care about him or her and I and I want us all to prosper and all to be able to work together better. Not everyone on the board, you know, is like that, but there is a sense of we have a shared future as an right. organization and, you right. know, find that shared future or die. You know, it sounds like <laughs> maybe that sounds too harsh, but. It's, it's a reality though, isn't it? And I, mm -hmm. well, you know, one of the things I tell my clients on Patton is the world is changing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and so we know that in, in another 20, 20 or 30 years, the face of America is going to look very different than it's looked in the past, right? And so we're no longer going to ignore the fact that there are brown people in this country. Black or brown, they're from different backgrounds, different countries, different traditions. And so we can't be ignored. And so we can no longer do things the same old way. And so we got we need to take a take a look around and say, okay, wait a minute, this is not my grandmother's board. Things are That's different right. now. <laughs> it's it's well put. And I well, let me ask you both this question. I'm sure when your process works best, the board at least acknowledges or has some buy-in. Um, or do you run into organizations where the executive director, the senior staff members coming to you? basically saying my board doesn't get it and so how do we help our staff friends listening now if they are struggling with a board that is frankly stuck in the past i think that 
I mean, yes, we've seen every combination of, you know, of executive director and board and uh, that you can imagine. Um, and I, and what we do in our work is we attempt to surface the multiple truths that are happening inside of an organization. Right. And so we will not mince words. We certainly interview staff members and find out what's what they're what's on their mind. We interview yep. board members, we interview people of all different races, and we sh we share that back with the board and you know whoever else, the senior staff, whoever is involved in this process. And then then if there are challenges, what do you want to do about it? You know, and Pat, one of the things I do is I turn the question around and I ask them, okay, so your board is not engaged. How have you been engaging them? Yep. You know what what have you what, what have you put into place to make sure that the board has active ways to stay involved with your organization in between meetings in between board meetings what is your board doing you know and particularly if you only meet quarterly that so might reveal to, yeah might, so three or four months happens between meetings and in between those meetings they hear nothing from you except please pay your dues or, or raise some money for us you've not engaged them in terms of what's going on with events you, there's no newsletter you know you're not inviting them to be and be active on social media like there are not things that you're doing to to keep them engaged and so i turn the question around and say okay maybe the board is not engaged and they're not doing but they're just regular volunteers they're regular people who have said yes i just want to help this organization they're not trained fundraisers they right. often sometimes they don't work in the nonprofit sector they may work for a bank they may work you know for a, a car dealership they may be teachers they don't work in the nonprofit sector they don't know what nonprofit work means they don't know what that looks like so that means the onus is on you to train them mm -hmm. and to teach them and provide opportunities for them to be involved and to engage and once you do all of that if they're not still engaged then maybe we need to change your board but yes, we need indeed. to take a look inward first to see what you're doing or not doing on the inside that might be causing your board to to be disengaged well and renee maybe you were going to touch on this because i would say yeah if, if i'm not creating any engagement at all it would be difficult it would seem to me that to then bring in the difficult conversations that we need to have um mm -hmm. and i guess crystal that's your point right we got to first create an environment for conversation or renee that's what i guess you all are doing because you're probably bringing people to the table in conversational ways that they not are not used to having well yeah and the funny thing is um you know we did this crystal and i did this webinar uh not long ago at where we were sharing some practices for building belonging and we talked about belonging as you know it's the difference between let's say welcoming and belonging and welcoming is is there's a person in power looking down and saying oh you're all welcome you know it's and it's very it's kind of top down and yes. belonging is you have a circle and and you, as you walk into that circle, you feel like, wow, I, I have a place in this circle. And so we, these are practices that we talk about in terms of, all right, how do you build belonging among people of different races, people of different you know, sexual orientations, disability, all of that. And then someone said to me, well, wow, this is really great. You know, there's plenty of white people on the board who also don't feel like, like that anybody, you know, that, that these practices really hold in general for just having a strong board culture where yeah. everybody contributes. It was really interesting. It's like, oh yeah, okay, that's true. You know, you 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 start you start hearing from everybody. And actually, again, I think this goes back to it's it, it's a better shared future and better collaboration for all by by doing some of this well it, it, that's a fantastic point and crystal mm -hmm. i want to go back to a point you made about this journey everyone might not stay with it and i guess is it your point both of your points that perhaps that's okay that not everybody needs to remain on the board if they're not willing to engage is but is that crystal i'll pose to you first you have to go into this process and say hey if you're not willing to go to the finish line with me, that's okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Because we want willing participants. We want folks who, who who are willing to change their mindsets and willing to say, okay, what we've been doing has not been working. People yep. are feeling excluded. People are being hurt. Um, and we cannot continue this way. And the only other way we are going to make change is if 
we are willing and open and it's not going to happen overnight and there's no t- fixed time point on it and we realize it's a process but we're willing to keep the work going and so one of the things that renee and i assure before we end our time with them is we give them uh, an opportunity to to outline two or three priorities two or three active ways that they can keep the work going after we're done with them because we don't want to just say okay now the the training is over good luck goodbye yeah, right <laughs> <laughs> right. And so you have some when we help them to identify, we don't tell them what their priorities are. We don't tell them what their goals are. They themselves talk about their own priorities and goals. And then they get this this whole process about the you know the timeline for that, who the benchmarks, who's going to be responsible for what and getting that goal achieved. And so we we send them off so that for the next six months to a year, they have kind of their own their own marching orders that they created and what they're gonna fo- focus on and what, how they're gonna be. So love that point. In fact, I was gonna ask you. Renee, they, you know, what, as Crystal said, what, what do you do when you're done? Or how do you assure that I'm going to maintain the progress that you two are certainly going to help us make? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, we, we do work with them on a plan, and it has some benchmarks. And, and, and just, I think this goes back to um, something, I mean, there is this element of, you know, of, of perfectionism that sometimes can come in, which is kind of this white supremacist idea. And we don't, you know, we don't, you don't have to be perfectionist, or you don't have to have this sense of urgency about this. These are problems that emerged over, you know, 400 years in America's creation and founding and, you know, rolling along. And they're not going to be solved in in a three month training with, you know, six meetings or whatever. Um, But at the but on the other hand, it's like, all right, what we're 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 encouraging organizations to get on the path and keep going and really build up that energy and alignment and shared understanding of what the challenges are and desire to keep going. So um, and, and man, I mean, this is this is really lifelong work. I believe it is. I think, you know, Crystal does. Too. And so it's like, we're not done. So why would we say that? Yeah, why it's would not we a think short that term. Board is, is, I mean, we're not done as a country, you know, like, so, yeah. It's, you know, Pat, I think right. one of the reasons why our cross team works and, and just because of who we are, you know, Renee and I are both willing to be vulnerable when we're working with our clients. We don't pretend to have all the answers. We don't pretend to have arrived. We're both still working on ourselves. We're both works in progress. We have very different backgrounds in terms of how we were grown, how we were raised and how we grew up. Um, and I share mine and she shares hers and I'm still working through mine. And so when I, when we're meeting with clients, we sit in the circle. We don't sit in front of the room. We sit in the circle and say, listen, we're part of this process. And while nice. you're learning, we're learning, <laughs> you know, so we're the facilitators, but we're learning from you as much as you're learning from us. So, yeah, and, well and I wanted to, I wanted to add, add to that, which is, um, I, I, you know, my background is in education. I think a lot about behavior change. And we did, we were, or before we started the call, we, we were talking about Resmo Menekem. And he's somebody that talks about, you know, about the, the physical experience of you know of racism and how we're holding this in our bodies and so i i don't want to sound too woo woo you know but i think we we don't we don't say this is just an intellectual process when we work with this is really if you want to make shifts this is not about reading a worksheet and checking things off because yeah. you're not going to learn you're you might be check them off but you are not things are yeah. not going to change whereas yeah. if you start level. to really like open your heart to, to understanding what what people are holding, what people are bringing to the board, their past life experiences, and then the, this idea. I mean, going back to this idea of equity, who you know who can weigh in on some of these challenges, and how does your how can your organization really take a stand on that? Let me ask you this. Uh, that, thank you. Very well put. <laughs> and as you both ponder particular projects, obviously not naming the organization. Is is there one that you're particularly proud of uh, that you've maybe revisited and what were they like and then where do they end up positively? And I guess similarly, have you, you've run into some that maybe just didn't seem to grasp it? Um, you know, so do you have an example uh, on both sides of that equation uh, <laughs> that you do. could share? <laughs> Go ahead, Crystal. Yeah. What, what, so what? Yeah. So what, what did you? Mind. Yeah. What did you arrive with, and then where did they go? What was the yeah, transformation? No, I, I, well, 
you know, we had an organization, it was a consortium of organizations yep. uh, that we were working with, and they were really trying to um, figure out what they were doing wrong. They recognized that there was a need for change, and we spent an, an, an enormous amount of time just trying to figure out the definition of the word equity. Right, we had to come up with an equity definition, and we went round and round and round and round and round. And I was like, "Oh my God!" And you know, we 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 came up with one, and then we were presented to the group, and then they would like change this word, change that word, and I was just like, "Oh my goodness!" And so we interviewed some folks who, um, some 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 BIPOC folks in that group to find out what some of the issues were. Um, and I think they were making great efforts. I still don't know with this particular group if if we came around the way that we wanted to. I don't know, Renee, you know who we're talking about. So what do you what do you think? I think there were I think there were some aha moments and some learning moments, but I still think there were some challenges in that group when we when we left them. I feel like the the biggest success of the project was that uh, that they had not felt that that the perspectives of black, indigenous and people of color were centered in their work. And that because of that, even though they were trying to represent a large group of people, and I won't say anymore just for confidentiality, they 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 were uh, there were some criticisms around equity, um, and you know, and this was a group of people that were pretty knowledgeable about the issues. Yeah. So I think that you know that my takeaway was. It was in this case, it was up to the white people to really do more listening and to really understand the challenges, as Crystal has mentioned, that some of the, you know, the people of color were having just in participating. Because it was like, oh, well, this this coalition is having five meetings a week and we're out there organizing and we can't make it. Can't you know, and, and so you want us to you want us to be part of the coalition, but how can we when we are really don't even have like even time is a you know even in this you know is a resource that we don't have and that's pretty common yeah well put mm -hmm. <laughs> anything anything surprise you uh, again I, both of you strike me as as folks that are going to continue to learn and build on the process anything surprise you so far anything you've learned in particular through the experience of facilitating these kind of trainings and workshops well, I think for me, you know, when we do our race caucusing, Renee takes the white folks and she goes and caucuses with them and I get the people of color, yep. right? And so what that means is just not black people, right? I'm a black person, but I have Asians, I have Indians, I've had Hispanics, you know, so my group, even though we're people of color, <laughs> pretty diverse in all and of, of us, itself all of us have different experiences and so you know uh, and we and i often will poll the group and say for those for those folks in the room who are not black you know how do you feel because sometimes you guys might feel like the invisible minority we're always talking black white right we don't hear a lot from Asians. we don't hear a lot from hispanics you know how how would you like to weigh into this conversation you know we talk about their backgrounds and how they were raised and their traditions and it's very different than even mine and so trying to come to some some consensus even in a group where we're all the the minority but we're a diverse minority yes is even more challenging so i have had learned to be quiet and listen and hear from them and sometimes it means pulling, you know, the person who is in the room who may come from a culture where they weren't taught to speak up, right? And so they're the right. person that's just kind of listening and just saying, you know, you're in a safe space now. It's okay um, to say what's on your heart. It's to say it's okay to share what you've experienced or what you've been thinking. Are you angry? Do you feel fearful? Do you feel resentment? You know, it's okay now to speak in this environment. You know, we're not going to, what happens in these walls stays in these walls. And so I think for me, having the discernment to, to be quiet uh, and not going into a caucus thinking, well, yeah, I'm black, so I know what all people of color think. And I, all of us in the room are gonna all think the same thing and we're all mad and we're all angry. And it's really not the case in some time, in some instances, so. Such a good point. Thank you for sharing that. and. Renee, same question. Anything strike you as you continue, yeah. I know, to build on the great work you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, I I think a lot about how does change happen? And so I'm always watching because I think we all want to know, well, this is a huge challenge. So what what are some of the levers? 
And so some of the things that something that surprised me, and I always mention this, you know, this white woman, Emily, where we we had met as a white caucus, and then we came back and we were with the whole group together. And the, and Emily is, you know, long somebody who's done racial justice work for many years. And as we all came together, the first thing she said was, you know, I just feel really sad about the racism that is and sad and ashamed of the racism in our society and and on our board and our organization. Wow. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, you know, just to to see that there is someone who is going to stand up and just and name what she feels is happening and start to courageously shift the organization. And so I think like as we come in and as we I mean, anyone who does this work, right? We are looking for those Emily's basically they're now they're not everyone, but right. they, they are out there and we got to, you know, and we're also trying to create the space for people like Emily to, to speak up and say what she sees. That voice to be heard. Right. And mm -hmm. Crystal, you said it, creating a safe space. And that, I guess, leads to my, my final question for both of you. Well, we have some other wrap up discussion, but final question is, all right, I'm, I'm a listener now. I hear you. I'm like, wow, my organization needs to do something. Any advice you'd have for a nonprofit leader who's acknowledging the challenge, but what, what do I do about it? Crystal, your phrase about creating safe spaces strikes me as something, but maybe you suggest something else. Yeah, as so I always tell uh, my clients that, you know, you need to start doing uh, so encouraging your staff and your board to do some individual work. Um, to really start looking at themselves, take a selfie uh, and where they stand individually when it comes to this kind of conversation. Because like you said, everyone's not going to be along for the ride. Some people have never thought about these things. They've not had to. Right. right? And so <laughs> this might be the first time where they're being challenged to actually read or listen or uh, to engage in conversations about race, about racism, about their own privilege, about blind spots, about um, being an ally, you know, this, these might all be new words for them. And so um, really getting a, 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 a taking the temperature of the people on the team to see if they're ready to actually have these conversations. Um, and once they do start doing their own work, then I think they'll be better prepared to come and say, okay, now that we have, um, now let's come together as a team and have those conversations. But I do think it starts in, individually one by one are your team members willing to engage in this work? And that means having to take a look at their own selves, their own lives, their own biases, some of the things that they've said and done uh, that may not be proud moments for them. Indeed, what great advice. They got to be willing to reflect on the the kind of the, the concepts here, which are not gonna be comfortable for everybody in the room, but mm -hmm. Renee, same question. Uh, a nonprofit oh. leader comes to you and says, what do I do? What do you advise? Well, you can call Crystal and I. We're happy to <laughs> <laughs> talk Perfect. to them about potentially yes. working with their organizations. Um, I think that, you know, the one, the thing that I would say is just going back to this theme of like, this is behavior change. And so you need support for behavior change. You probably are not going to be able to do it by yourself. Yeah. Uh, um, unless you're very unusual. I mean, yeah. maybe Hard to there facilitate are your own. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can. Yeah, I completely agree. I am. I am reading all the time. Crystal and I have our own personal book club slash podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> listening club. Indeed. Um, but 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 at the so you yes, it is so important to and to educate yourself. And then, are there other other places that you might go, or is this something where you know? Um, where a group of people could start to talk about what's emerging so that you don't feel so alone in this in this work. That's so well put. Mm -hmm. And like everything both of you have shared, this is fantastic advice. And I'm delighted that our listeners can, oh. uh, you know, forced to think about these important topics because it, it's easier to just keep these things on the back burner. And kind of like your illustration of the museum, Crystal, we just keep it on the back wall and really don't want to think about it, but mm -hmm. we need to think about it. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I'm grateful to both of you. Speaking of your book club, however, <laughs> let's add some other bonus material to this conversation. <laughs> Renee, you know it's coming. Crystal, you're next. Uh, what, tell me about a book that's been right. meaningful to you that you'd recommend to our listeners. 
Right. So one a book that I found very powerful was Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And it is, it is uh, the image that she uses in the book is about a house that, you know, racism and race relations as, as a house where you know, the, maybe there's some challenges in the basement and you can't just say, oh, we're going to ignore the challenges in the, in the foundation and everything's going to be fine. Right, that you really have to go and, and look at the foundation of your house or of your nation to understand why things are the way they are now, and then understand, begin to understand how to, you know, how, okay, how can we reinforce our foundation um, so that we have a different future together across yeah. race? But it's such a powerful book. Um, not always the easiest read, but um, but really worth worth reading. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Renee. Definitely, we'll add that to the list. And is uh, Crystal, I'm sure you have another book that you could add <laughs> to our list. So tell us what would yeah, you recommend? Yeah, and I made I made reference to it a little bit earlier in my conversation, um, and that's the Some of Us by Heather McGee. And yeah. I love Heather McGee. She actually has a podcast now called The Some of Us. Uh, and I've been listening to it, but I love Heather McGee because she's just real people. You know, she just breaks it down, but she talks about um, the willingness of, of white people to um, to suffer uh, as a result of their of the, of the way that they exclude uh, people who don't look like them. Right? right. And so the example of the swimming pools and draining the swimming pools in the 1950s, I think is so poignant. That seems to be the, the, the one example that people remember the book for that, uh, that this willingness to drain the swimming pools rather than let black people or people of color swim in the same swimming pool. So no one gets a pool. Right. So if, if they go to swim with us, then no one gets to be able to swim. Yep. A sad <laughs> legacy. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the book really talks about how we all uh, how how inclusion really benefits all of us. And so she does a, a wonderful way and provides numerous examples of that in the book. And so I highly recommend it. Yeah, delighted to lift up both of those wonderful examples in our show notes. And of course, our listeners are going to need to go to the show notes to find out how to find both of you <laughs> and perhaps you two together. Uh, Renee, I'll let you go first. Yeah, where where can people go to find out more about you and the great work you're doing? Yeah, my firm is the Ross the Ross Collective. I'll say that slowly. So and uh, and yeah, I mean, would love to to connect. I do have a blog that I send a free you know newsletter that I send out every other week. I'm writing about uh, racial equity, nonprofit strategy, and leadership. Yeah, it's awesome. I've seen it. And as I have seen, Crystal, some great content from you. So where can people find out more yeah, about thanks. you? Thanks. Thanks, Patty. So yeah, so my website is theboardpro.com. And yes, you'll find all kinds of things on my website, including all of my services. You can learn about the training with the Renee and I do together. I wrote a children's book called Mac and Cheese. You can find out about my children's book on my website. You can buy some of my past webinars on my website. So yeah, go to boardpro.com and you'll find everything you need to know about me. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, and indeed, our listeners should, in fact, check out both of you and the great work you're doing. And for all of this wonderful advice, thank you both for joining me on the path. Thank you, thank you so for much. having us. This was a blast. Thank you. Well, I know you enjoyed this conversation with Crystal and Renee as much as I did, and hopefully came away with some practical ideas that can guide you on your leadership journey and help you sow the seeds of change with your board of directors. Don't forget about the show notes. They are available on our website, patentmcdowell.com. You can find out more about Crystal and her practice called The Board Pro and Renee's practice called The Ross Collective. Great resources, great information. Check them both out. As always, please share this episode with somebody else on the path. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe. Just go to that podcast page again at patentmcdowell.com and you'll see the follow button and follow equals subscribe. You won't miss out on any of our weekly episodes. They come out every Thursday. And if you like this one, you might want to click on the episodes button at the top of that same page. You can scroll through thumbnails of some of our most popular episodes or search by topic or guest name. Thanks for all you're doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. And keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week. I'll see you next time on The Path. <laughs>